Hey everyone, welcome to part 101 of my Pokemon game series in GMT. So in this video, we'll start refactoring our game to use a state stack architecture for handling states instead of using an enum. So we'll be building a state stack or state machine from scratch and we'll test it out by pushing and popping states to it. So the state stack architecture is a lot more scalable than our current approach and it'll make it much more easier to add features like layered menu in the future. So that's the main reason why I'm making this change right now. By the way, you can support the making of the series by becoming a Patreon and get some cool rewards for it, like access to the complete project files of the series, exclusive tutorials that are not covered on YouTube and access to the Discord community. So before we start, I want to say a huge thanks to all the Patreons who are currently supporting the channel. You guys make the series possible and I'm grateful to each and every one of you. So let's start the video. So before we start refactoring our project to use the state stack architecture, let me first explain what's the issue with the current architecture. So right now we're just using enums to handle state, right? And in the update function, we'll run different logic based on the value of the enum. So the problem with this approach is we can only handle one state at a time, right? We can't have multiple states on top of each other. So it will be hard to do things like going back to the previous state. Okay. So if we look at an example, so we can go to the dialogue state from multiple states, right? We can either show a dialogue from the free roam state or we can show it from the inventory state. So yeah, we can go to the dialogue state from different states and once the dialogue is complete, we want to return to the state from which we opened the dialogue, right? So while using the enum architecture for handling states, this is hard because we only know what the current state is. We don't have any idea about what the previous states are, right? So to solve this issue, we have to manually save the previous state in another variable. And once the dialogue is finished, we have to go back to that state. Right. So the problem with this is since we are setting it manually, it's prone to error because, because in some places we might forget to do it before going to the dialog state. So this is not a really clean approach. And another thing is using this approach, we can only go back to the last state, but if you want to go to the second last state or third last state, we won't be able to do it using this approach. Right. So again, to achieve that, we'll have to use hacks like this, where we create a variable like state before evolution and then store it. So yeah, the point is this approach is not clean and it's prone to error. Right now it's okay because our states are not that complex, but in the future, when we add things like layered menus, we won't be able to use this approach in a clean way. Okay. So that is the first limitation of using an enum. Another limitation is, it's hard to execute logic at the start and end of the state. Okay. So right now we are only executing the update logic of the state, but if you want to execute some code at the start or at the end of the state, that's kind of hard to do while using this approach. So let me explain this limitation with an example. So here you can see that in the start function of the game controller, we are listening to the events of the menu controller and evolution manager, shop controller, etc. But we don't have to listen to these events all the time from the game controller. We only have to listen to it when these states are active. Right. So for example, we only have to listen to the events of the menu controller when the menu controller is active. That is the more cleaner way of doing it. Right. Otherwise, if we get some unexpected events, then we might get bugs. Okay. So if you use the state machine approach, then each state will have an enter and exit function in which we can subscribe and unsubscribe to events. So we'll only be listening to those events when that state is active. Okay. So these are the main limitations of using the enum approach. So now let's look at the state stack approach that we are going to implement. So this is how a state stack will look like. So if you don't know what a stack is, think of it as a stack of books, right? 
So similarly, we'll have a stack of states like this, and we'll only run the state at the top of the stack. Okay. So in this case, the inventory state will be the state that will run because that's the state at the top of the stack. Right. And then you can perform two operations in the stack. So the first one is push. So this will allow you to push a state on top of the stack. Okay. So it's like adding a book on top of the book stack. So in this case, we push the dialog state on top of the stack. And now the dialog state will be the active state that will be executed. Okay. So push is one operation with which you can push a state onto the stack. And then we also have an operation called pop for removing a state from the top of the stack. Okay. So from the stack, if we pop a state, the dialog state will be popped and inventory state will be the one on the top. Okay. So the main advantage of using this approach is that we can easily push states on top of each other and we can pop a state if we want to go back to the previous state. Right. So here, since we open the dialog state from the inventory state, while closing the dialog, all we have to do is pop the dialog state and we'll go back to the previous state. So we don't have to keep track of it manually like we're doing it right now. So this is the concept of state stack. So let's start implementing it. So in the scripts folder inside util, I'll create a new folder called state machine. And in here, I'll create two new scripts. The first one will be called state machine and next one will be called state. So here I'm calling the class state machine and not state stack, but it's pretty much the same. State stack is just a state machine with the functionality to stack states on top of each other. And by the way, the reason why I'm creating this inside util is because a state machine is something that we can create once and reuse in multiple projects. So I have a single state machine class that I reuse in all my projects. So that's the reason why I'm putting it in the util folder. Okay, so let me open up the state machine script first. So here I'll get rid of the default code. And the state machine is going to be a plain C sharp class. So it won't inherit from mono behavior. All right. So next, I'll make the state machine a generic class by adding the at the end of the class. So this will be used to specify the owner of the state machine. All right. So for example, a state machine for handling battle states will be owned by the battle system. So in that case, the owner will be the battle system and we need to access the owner because the states will have to invoke common functionalities in the owner. Okay. So the state machine will be a generic class like this. And next, I also want to put the state machine class in a namespace. So here I'll create a namespace called gdutils dot state machine. And I'll put the class inside this namespace. Okay. So if you're not familiar with namespace, namespace is used to organize our code into different regions. So some people like to put all their classes inside a namespace, but I don't do that. I only put classes like these, which can be reused in multiple projects inside a namespace. So why am I doing this? Why am I putting this inside a namespace? The reason is because when you import more assets to your project, there might be other classes with the name state machine. Okay. So putting it inside a namespace will help us differentiate between the two classes and it will prevent conflicts between them. All right. So I'll put this in this namespace. So next let's define the state class. So let me get rid of the default code. And this is going to be the base class, which will be inherited by all our states. Okay. And this is going to inherit from mono behavior because we want to attach our state classes to the game object. 
okay and this will also be a generic class because we need access to the owner of the state machine all right so next i'll also put the state class in a namespace so let me just copy this namespace from here and let me put the state class inside this namespace all right so now in the state class we need to define three functions so the first one will be the function that will be called when we enter a state okay so here i'll create a public function called enter and this function will also take the owner of the state machine as a parameter all right and this function is not going to have an implementation we'll be inheriting this function from the state classes that inherit this base class okay so we have to make this function virtual so that we can override it from subclasses okay so next we'll create the function that will execute the logic of the state so let me just call this function execute and this will be the function that runs the logic of the state every single frame okay so it's kind of like the update function of the state machine and here we don't have to pass the owner because we are already passing it from the enter function so we can just cache it and use it everywhere else that will be the efficient way to do it all right so finally i'll also create an exit function so this function will be executed when we exit a state okay so these are the three functions that we need in a state so now we can go ahead and implement our state machine so in the state machine class first i'll create an object to store the current state of the state machine so let me create an object of type state and i'll call it current state and i'll actually make it a property so that we can access it from outside the class okay so note that i'm making the setter private so that we won't be able to set the current state but we'll be able to access it because the getter is public all right so next we need to define a stack of states in our state machine so this allows to push states on top of each other and also pop it when we want to go to the previous state so let's define a stack of states so to create a stack we have a predefined class in C sharp called stack. So this class comes with C sharp. So we don't have to create it manually. And this is going to be a stack of state. Right? So we'll define it like this. And I'll just call this state stack. Okay. And I'll also make it a property. Okay, so now we have the current state and the state stack. So next, since our state machine class is a plain C# -sharp class, we need to define a constructor for creating it. So let me create a constructor here. And this will take the owner of the state machine as a parameter. All right. And we can actually cast the owner so that we can use it outside the constructor. So here I'll create a public variable called owner and from the constructor I'll assign its value. Okay. So next we can do any other initializations we need to do from our state machine constructor. So we can actually initialize our state stack from here. Okay. And by the way, I made a spelling mistake here. This should be state stack, not stat stack. Okay. And let me initialize the state stack from here okay so next we need to create functions to push and pop states to our state stack so first i'll create a function to push a state to the state stack so let me create a public function called push and this function will take the state that we want to push so let me call this new state and in this function 
we have to push this new state to our state stack. So to push something onto the stack, we can use the predefined push function of the stack. All right, so I'll push the new state onto the stack. And next, we also have to change the current state. So I'll set the current state to the new state. So basically, the current state will always be the state at the top of the stack. We don't really need to store this in a separate variable because we can use a function to get the top state of the stack. But I feel like storing it in a variable will be better because we'll have to access it lots of times from our state machine. Okay. So next in the push function, we also have to do one more thing. So here when you're pushing a new state, we are transitioning from our old state to the new one. Right. So from here, we have to call the enter function of the new state. So I'll just call current state dot enter. Okay. And while calling the enter function, we also have to pass the owner. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So this function will push a new state onto our state stack and it will also enter that state. Okay. So next, let's create a function to pop a state from the state machine. All right. And in this function, we have to remove the state at the top of the stack. So we can do that by calling state stack dot pop function. Okay. And then we also have to change the current state. Right. So after we pop a state from the state stack, the current state will be the state that is currently at the top of the stack. Right. So we can get the state at the top of the stack by calling state stack dot peak. And we can assign it to our current state variable. Okay. And by the way, before we change the current state, we also have to exit the old current state that was popped. Right. So before we assign it, we can call current state dot exit. And this will exit the old current state. Okay. So now we have functions to push and pop states from our state stack. So next, I'll create a function to execute the current state of the state machine. So I'll create a public function called execute and this function will execute the current state of the state machine. Okay. And just to be safe, I'll use a null conditional operator so that in case if the current state is null, we won't get an exception. All right. So these are the three functions that we need to make our state stack work. But just for convenience, I'll also create another function called change state okay so this will be useful then we want to just replace the state at the top of the stack okay so in that case we won't have to pop the state and then push it we can just use this function okay so this function will take the new state to change as the parameter all right and in this function first we have to pop the old state and then we have to push the new state, right? So to pop the old state, I'll call state stack dot pop. And then I'll also exit the current state since we are popping it, all right? And we only want to do it if the current state is not null, right? Otherwise, it will just give you an exception if you're calling the change state function and if there is no current state. All right. So we have popped the old state. So next we have to push the new one. So let me just copy these three lines to push the new state. Okay. And we have a brace missing here. So let me put that. All right. So here we are popping the old state and pushing the new one. So using this function, we can easily replace the state at the top of the stack. 
All right, so these are all the functions that we need in our state machine. So next, let's try to create an instance of the state machine from our game controller. And let's make it run some state. So let me open up the game controller script. And here, I'll create an instance of the state machine. And by the way, since our state machine is in a different namespace, we'll have to import that namespace here if we want to access the state machine. Okay, so I'll use the control dot shortcut and I'll import the namespace of our state machine. Okay, so the owner of the state machine will be the game controller itself. So let me define that and I'll name this object as the state machine itself. And let me actually make it a property so that we can access it outside the game controller class. Okay, so now from the start function, we can initialize the state machine by calling the constructor. Okay, and here while calling the constructor, we have to pass the owner. So we can just pass this keyword here and it will pass the current instance of the game controller. All right. So now our state machine is initialized. So next we need to assign a state to our state machine and run it. Right. So we have lots of game states right now. So we want to convert all of them to use a state machine. But let's start by keeping things simple and just convert the free roam state to use a state machine. So for that, first we need to define a class called free roam state and make it inherit from our state class. Right. So unlike before, while using a state machine, all our logic of a state will be inside a separate class. Right. It won't be inside a if condition like this, like before. So let's create a new class for our free roam state. So let me go to Humility and in scripts, I'll create a new folder called game states. And in here, I'll create a new script called free roam state. Okay. So let me get rid of the default code. And this class is going to inherit from our state class, right? So again, to access the state class, we have to import the gdutils.stateMachine class. Okay. And we also have to specify the owner here. So the owner of the state machine is the game controller. Okay. So next, we have to define the logic of the free roam state in the execute function, right? So let's look at the logic of the free roam state. So in the free roam state, we want to give the control to the player controller and let the player move around, right? So we are doing that by calling player controller dot handle update. And then we can also do other things like open the menu. But first let's start with moving the player. So from here, first let me override the execute function. And from this function, we have to call player controller dot handle update and let the player move. Right. So since player controller is a singleton, I can use player controller dot i dot handle update. All right. So now when we execute the free roam state, we should be able to move our player around. Right. So let's go ahead and set the state from the game controller. So in the start function, I'll set the first state of the state machine to free roam state by calling state machine dot change state. And here for the new state, we have to pass the free roam state, right? But how can we pass the free roam state here? So we can easily do that if we make the free roam state a singleton, right? So in my state machine architecture, all the states are going to be a singleton so that we can easily access it and switch to it. So here, let me create a public static instance of the free roam state.
and let me just assign it from the awake function. So now to access the free roam state, we can just use free roam state dot i. Okay. So this should change the current state of the state machine to free roam state. And then finally, in the update function, we have to execute the state machine. And we don't have to execute this piece of code anymore because now we do have the free roam state in the state machine. Okay. And by the way, let me just remove the else over here to make sure that there are no errors. And instead of executing this code, all we have to do is call state machine dot execute. Okay. That should execute the free roam state because that's the state we are setting to the state machine by default. Okay. So now let's go to humanity and try running this. So first we have to assign our free roam state to the game controller. Okay. And now if we run the game, we should be able to move our player around in the free roam state. So yeah, you can see that we are able to move the player around just like before, but now we are not using this piece of code to do it. Instead, we are using our free roam state of our state machine. Right. So that's great. We have made our state machine work. So next, we need to try pushing and popping states to our state machine. So in our free roam state, when the player presses the enter button, we have to go to the menu state. Right. And then when the player presses the back button from the menu state, we have to come back to the free roam state. So this is a perfect scenario in which we have to use the push and pop operation of the state machine. Okay. So when we open the menu, we should actually push the menu state on top of the free roam state in the stack. And then from the menu state, when we press back, we have to pop it. Right. So let's go ahead and implement that now. So first, let me create a new class for the menu state. All right, so here I'll create a new script and I'll call it game menu state. All right, so let me get rid of the default code and the game menu state is going to inherit from the state class. Okay. And to use the state class, we have to import our namespace. All right. So next, we can make this class a singleton so that we can easily access it from other classes. So I'll just copy this piece of code from the free roam state and I'll change it to game menu state. Okay. So now from the free roam state, if the user presses the enter button, we have to switch to the menu state, right? So if you look at our previous code for the free roam state, that is what we are doing. If the enter key is pressed, then we are changing the state to menu, right? So let's do the same from here. If the enter key is pressed, then we can push the menu state onto our state machine. So to do that, first we need a reference to the state machine. So we can get that from the owner of the state machine. So let me just override the enter function to get the reference to the owner. All right. And let me just cache it onto a private variable so that we can use it outside the enter function. Okay, so now we have access to the owner, which is the game controller, and using it, we can access the state machine and we can push the game menu state. Okay, 
So now when we press the enter or the return key, it should push the game menu state. And next, from the game menu state, if we press the X key, then we should pop the game menu state and go back to the free roam state. Right. So let's also implement that. So first I'll write the execute function. And from here, if the user pressed the X key, then we can just pop the game menu state. So to do that, again, you need to access the state machine. So let me grab a reference to the owner from the enter function. Okay. And from here, if the X key is pressed, I'll call state machine dot pop and pop the menu state. Okay. And we press the enter key from the free roam state. We should push the menu state. And when we press X from the menu state, we should pop it and go back to the free roam state. Right. So before we test, let's also create text that will display all our states in the state stack so that we can just visualize and see what's happening. Okay. So to create a text, you don't have to create a canvas in the scene. There is actually an easier way of creating text if the purpose of that text is to show debug details like this. Okay. So what we can do is we can use a function called on GUI or on GUI and in this function we can create any UI that we want from the code just like we create our edit scripts. Okay. So for example, if I want to create a label, I can say GUI layout dot label. And let's say I want to write something like state stack in the label. So now when I run the game, I should see a label called state stack at the top right of the screen. So note that this is not an efficient way of creating game UI. Unity only recommends creating UI for debugging and testing using this method. The efficient way of creating UI is by using the canvas itself. Okay, so here we have a label, but it's pretty small. So let's make it a bit bigger. So we can do that by giving a style to the label. So here I'll create a variable for the style. So we can create that by using the GUI style class. And using the style, we can set things like the font type and font size and all that. So I'll just set the font size to something higher like 24. And I'll pass that for the style of the label. Okay, so let's try testing it now. So now you can see that the font is much bigger. Okay, so next, we want to display all the states in our state stack. Right, so from here, I'll use a for each loop to loop through all the state in the state stack. So we can get the state stack from the state machine. Okay, and inside the loop, we can use GUI.label function to display the name of the state. So we can get the name of the state from its type. Right. So I'll use state dot get type and I'll just convert the type into a string by using to string function. Okay. So now this should display all the states in our state stack. So let's go to unity and test. Okay. So yeah, you can see it here. Right now, only the free roam state is there in our state stack. But if I press enter, it should also push the menu state. But it did not. Instead, we have an exception. So this is because even though we created the game menu state, we did not attach it to our game controller. Right. So if we don't do that, then we won't be able to access it using the singleton pattern. So I'm just going to assign the game menu state onto the game controller. 
OK. And now if you test, we should be able to push the menu state onto our stack. So yeah, right now I'm in the free roam state. But now if I press enter, as you can see that we pushed the game menu state onto the stack. And right now the menu state is the one at the top of the stack. OK. And also when we are in the menu state, we won't be able to move because we are not calling player controller dot update. Right. So next, if I press the X key, then we should pop the menu state from the stack and we should go back to the free roam state. Right. So now I'm able to walk like usual. So yeah, you can see how we can easily push and pop states into our state stack. So whenever I use the state stack architecture, I like to have this UI at the side of the game because it will help me understand what all states we have in the stack and what's the current state and all that, which will make it really easy to debug any issues we have. Okay, so this is a really handy UI to have while using the state stack architecture. Okay, so right now, even though we're pushing the menu state when we press enter, we are not doing anything in the menu state. Right, so in the menu state, we have to show the menu and we have to let the user select an item from the menu. So we'll be doing that in the next video. And in the next video, we'll also start creating a generic selection system, which we can reuse for all our selection UI. It'll help us to reduce lots of duplicate code. So that will be done in the next video. But for now, we have implemented the state stack architecture and we can easily push and pop states onto it. So I'll stop the video here. If you think this video is helpful, please leave a like and consider subscribing to my channel. You can also support the series by becoming a Patreon if you can afford it. So thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.